Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Palmerston. Uh, I'm Luke Gosling, the federal member for Solomon, which takes in all of Darwin and most of Palmerston. Uh, I share um, Palmerston with the seat of Lingyari and very happy to do so. Uh, it's a great day. It's a great day for Palmerston, but also the region, um, because we've got a fantastic announcement today that's about health, the health of Territorians making sure everyone's well and got culturally appropriate, great health services for this region. Um, we're just stoked to have our Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, in town um, for this announcement, and I'll pass to him uh, shortly. Uh, also want to acknowledge Warren Snowden, the member for Lingari, uh, but also our Labor candidate for Lingari, Marion Scrimgeour. It's wonderful to have her here because uh, hopefully those constituents in Lingari um, will be able to be well represented by Marion and will be using these, uh, these fantastic facilities, the new facility that we will build. Uh, we've also got NT Senator Malandiri McCarthy with us and uh, we've got the good folk from Danila Dilba and they'll be having a bit more to say in a second. I just want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the former CEO Olga Havnan as well as the new CEO, uh, Rob McPhee. I've uh, been working on this commitment for some time, knowing the huge increase in need for these services out in Palmerston as Palmerston grows, uh, not only to look after the people who call this wonderful place home, but also visitors that come into town uh, from time to time. Uh, so with Labor, you'll always know that we'll be providing great health services for Territorians and so it's fantastic to have you here, Elbo, for this great announcement. Well, thanks very much, Luke, and it's great to be back in Darwin and here at Palmerston, back with you again and with my parliamentary colleagues, the team, uh, Warren, future team member, Marion, and also uh, Malandiri, and I thank uh, Rob and Tiana for showing us around this very important facility. Uh, this facility here makes a difference. It makes a difference to people's lives. Danila Dilba has nine separate facilities, including uh, mobile facilities, uh, looking after First Nations people's health. And we have had a reminder, if ever we needed one, of how important primary health care is for keeping people safe as a precondition as well, for them able to participate in the labour market, for them to be able to participate in society. And we know that here in Palmerston is where the fastest growing area for First Nations people is. This facility right here looks after some 5,000 people, 5,000 of the 15,000 people who this service delivers for at the top end. So it's an important facility, but it needs upgrade. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, they provided uh, vaccinations for people, they provided care for people during COVID and they're continuing to do so, continuing to play a role in the rollout of the vaccine, the rollout of boosters, uh, the provision of rapid antigen tests, all of those things that are needed to keep people safe. Uh, this funding, $11.6 million, uh, will enable a purpose-built facility that's fit for purpose. Uh, we know that the service that's being delivered has essentially outgrown this facility which is why we need to invest here in primary health care. Labor will always be the party that defends Medicare and always be the party that is better on health care. This announcement today uh, with uh, Luke Gosling is something that he's worked for for a long period of time. It's an important announcement that will make a real difference to people's lives. And I'd ask uh, Rob and Tiana, uh, who uh, provide the services here, to just outline briefly uh, what a difference this funding will make. Rob? Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, uh, Anthony and Luke, uh, for coming and making the announcement here today. Um, my name's Rob McPhee. I'm the CEO of the Nilla Dilba Health Service, and I'd like to um, start by acknowledging and paying respects to the Larrakia people, the traditional owners of the lands upon which we're meeting. Um, Danila Dilba welcomes the commitment made by uh, Mr Albanese and the Federal Labor Party uh, for funding to establish 
a, a purpose-built comprehensive primary health care hub uh, to service the growing health needs of the, our clients and community across the Palmerston region. We, as uh, Anthony mentioned, we currently operate nine clinics across Darwin um, with about 15,000 clients and over 5,000 or a third of those clients currently access the Palmerston Clinic. We have seen significant growth across this part of the, the country uh, within the Aboriginal population but also our clients um, and this has been going on for several years and our facilities that we're uh, meeting at here are, are really outgrowing uh, the needs of the community. As we know, life expectancy for Aboriginal people remains almost 10 years short of that of non-Aboriginal Australians and access to high quality, culturally appropriate and what we call comprehensive primary health care is critical to overcoming this gap. What this funding that's been announced today will do is provide us with a health hub uh, where our clients can access a range of health and wellbeing services. This will not only support our clients to manage their own health, uh, but will help contribute to our clients living long and healthy lives and reducing the needs to visit hospitals, which is a very expensive way to provide care. Uh, the inv investment being announced today in this important piece of infrastructure will ensure that Danila Dilba is able to not only meet the growing demands of our services in the immediate future, um, but will help set us up for the outstanding work that we're going to do over the coming years as well. Um, I'll now hand you over to uh, our regional manager for the Palmerston region, Tiana McCoy. Thank you. Uh, as Rob mentioned, my name's Tiana McCoy. Uh, I'm the regional manager who currently oversees the clinics within Danella Dilba. I've worked for Danella Dilba for over eight years. Um, I've seen the growth uh, within the organisation, um, the evolution of our service. Um, and I'll speak more so to the growth of the organisation in this area. Um, so the site that we're at is the Palmerston Clinic. Um, it was originally opened as the Family Centre and Women's Centre. Uh, in 2015, due to demand, we had to expand out the Women's Centre uh, and we have a dedicated building uh, for our women uh, maternal health services which is located uh, behind this clinic and is still operational today. Um, the, I guess what a new clinic means to the people of Palmerston means that we can provide them with a fully functional clinic. At the moment, we're providing services with limited capacity in terms of space. Um, what the new clinic will allow us to provide is a space for social and emotional wellbeing services to be provided um, in an adequate, culturally safe environment. Uh, it will also allow for us to host allied and specialist services um, and also provide a space for our child development team to undertake uh, assessments of, of our young children. In 2022 and beyond, uh, the need to have a purpose-built facility for our, our staff and clients in Palmerston is crucial in meeting the health needs of our clients. We are heartened to hear that our calls for such a facility are being heard. Um, and like Rob, I also welcome the pledge by Mr Albanese and the Labor Government to help us build a clinic in this, uh, in this region for the people of Palmerston and surrounding areas. Well, thanks very much, Tiana and Rob. I think you've heard why this is important. This is about a practical measure, which is a part of our commitment to close the gap. Uh, we know that the, 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 the cat gap is a chasm in so many areas, including in health and life expectancy and we need to support culturally uh, sensitive delivery of services. Uh, this clinic does just that, and this announcement today will make it even better in the future. Happy to take questions. Well, the $11.6 million of this, this labour budget cover the entire cost of upgrading the facility, or will the territory government increase that money to pay for it? Well? Uh, this is our commitment that we believe is enough uh, to deliver uh, the facility uh, in full. Uh, we, of course, I'm sure that they'd be keen for any additional funding as well, but we wanted to make sure that, that there's no conditions on this. This will be in our first budget. It will be delivered. Is this an example of the importance of the CWDRE in the next election? This is an, uh, an example of the importance of health care mm -hmm. and the importance of delivering for First Nations people. Uh, where I am, in the inner west of Sydney, I can get access as a, a, a relatively privileged fellow to a whole range of health services. Uh, the truth is that uh, First Nations people, both people who live here in Palmerston, but also those who 
who, who visit, transient populations, get delivered services by Donella Dilba, including through their mobile services. Uh, so this is an example of doing the right thing. Uh, we will continue uh, to support uh, good projects uh, wherever they are, and it's important uh, that we provide health services to First Nations people. Uh, we know we know that the gap is there. The gap's there in terms of all of the indicators when it comes to health. Yep. All of the indicators. I'm sorry, the Northern Territory as a whole obviously suffers from an inequity compared to the rest of the nation in health care. So what uh, will Labor commit in terms of increasing the percentage of hospital funding that the Commonwealth will pay uh, to states and territories, but the Territory in particular, given that we can see right now our hospitals are mm -hmm. raising funds? Indeed. Look, we, we will have more to say on health care uh, during the election campaign. Uh, but uh, today's announcement is about this specific service. It's a, it's a real commitment for a real facility that will make a real difference. And uh, that's what uh, we're doing here today. Uh, we know that. Uh, the issue of health care, we've had a reminder during the pandemic. Some said, do you have the right health outcome? or the right economic outcome, that there was a tension between the two things. After, in the third year of this pandemic, we know that when you don't get the health outcomes right, the economic outcomes are worse as well. That's why the rollout of the vaccine should have been uh, delivered far more efficiently. That's why there should have been much better uh, targeting and support focusing on vulnerable groups, including uh, First Nations people. That's why the, the booster, if you'd rolled out the, the vaccine earlier, the booster would have been rolled out earlier as well. That's why rapid antigen tests should have been uh, not waited until January before the federal government bothered uh, to put in an order. In so many areas, Scott Morris has been too little and too late, has characterised the response. We also know uh, that in healthcare, primary healthcare ends up as well saving money. If you get to people earlier with people they trust, so if they have a niggle, they come somewhere like this where there's a trusting relationship being built up, there's less likely of an acute event that's far more costly both for the individual's health but also uh, for uh, the health system to deal with that acute condition. Well, there was a, an op-ed written by a former Australian diplomat, Bruce Hay. Um, and uh, that's a, a matter for uh, Mr Haig. Uh, he's usually bagging me on, on social media. The government's betraying you as weak on national security. Do you think that cuts through with COVID? Well, I'm here in Darwin, and I was part of a government as a cabinet minister and the leader of the government of the, in the House of Representatives in Julia Gillard's government that put the US Marines here. They upgraded our defence relationship with the United States. And I was also the infrastructure shadow minister who opposed the sale of the Port of Darwin to a company that was connected uh, with, uh, with the government of China. Will you tear up that agreement with Labor in government? Look, we think that it shouldn't have happened in the first place. And it's extraordinary that uh, the person uh, who, uh, of course, uh, took, uh, took pride in negotiating the China FTA agreement, uh, ended up being on the board, or on the payroll of that company. Uh, we will always stand up for Australia's interests. That's why we also oppose the extradition treaty uh, with China that this government uh, tried to ram through and they said we were irresponsible for doing so. Uh, we'll always stand up for Australia's interests, but I think the national security analysts this week <coughs> have made their position very, very clear. They have said it is not in Australia's interest to look for false distinctions. They have said that uh, the both sides of Australian politics have a bipartisan position uh, when it comes to our US alliance, when it comes to on China, on Hong Kong, on Taiwan, on the South China Sea, on the treatment of Uyghurs, on, on Tibet, on all of those issues. Uh, we have a common view and that it's not in Australia's interests. Uh, what I want to do is unite the country. I want to unite the country because unity is strength. 
What Scott Morrison keeps trying to do uh, as a desperate political measure is divide the country. It is not in Australia's national interest to have a divided country based upon uh, fake news. And we know, we know what uh, his own colleagues think about his capacity to not tell the truth. Uh, the fact is that his Deputy Prime Minister has said that over a long period of time he's observed uh, that Scott Morrison is a hypocrite and a liar. Uh, that's unfortunate that that characteristic is there. I'd say uh, when it comes to national security, uh, he should listen to what the Director General of ASIO said this week. He should listen to what uh, no less than the former uh, Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Secretary of the Department of Defence, uh, Head of ASIO and Ambassador to Washington, appointed by John Howard. That's Dennis Richardson's credentials. And he's made some very strong comments, very strong comments uh, this week. It doesn't matter how desperate Scott Morrison is to avoid discussion about health care, about education, about the response to the pandemic, about vaccinations, about uh, the problems with skill shortages in our economy, about a plan for the future, about his failure to actually have a serious energy policy. And, you know, yesterday we had the largest uh, power station in Australia announce a bring forward of a closure. Uh, the government apparently was flat footed on that and didn't even know about it. Uh, what we need from this Prime Minister is for him to do his job. And his job is not to try to scare people. His job is to look after the interests of the nation. But do you think that the Port of Darwin is a security threat? As you just mentioned, it shouldn't have happened in the first place. Then why not commit to acting in some way? We opposed the sale of Darwin from the beginning. So what would we, you do about it in government? We opposed... We're not in government. We're not in government. Uh, we, we hope to be in government, and when you're in government, you're able to uh, examine a whole range of issues. And uh, the truth is, though, that we opposed it at the time. Uh, we opposed it. I, I think that there's a case for strategic assets uh, to be uh, in the national interest to remain uh, in Australian hands. It's unfortunate that that didn't happen. Why did you repeat that? Sorry, I really couldn't hear that. That sounds like you're saying you would bring the port back into Australia's hands. No, I'm saying that uh, governments can make decisions. Uh, what I've said is that that shouldn't have happened in the first place, and we opposed it at the time. Why did you repeat the term mentoring candidate in Parliament, given, uh, you know, you said agreed, and the boss, and we heard the idea of boss say it's politicised and you should just do that. Why did you then repeat it, and is that what you really think of the Prime Minister? Look, I was saying that in terms of his position that he's put forward, the actions that he is doing at the moment, in the words of Dennis Richardson, in the words of Dennis Richardson, uh, Australia's most celebrated uh, public servant when it comes to national security issues, foreign affairs head, defence head, ASIO head, ambassador to, to Washington, our most important ambassador, has said that it only serves, the rhetoric of the government only serves the interests of one country, China, not Australia. So why did you send the treatment of women in Parliament has been a hot button issue. What's your response to Nicole Flint's accusation that you personally ignored her calls for you to rein in left wing misogynistic attacks on her? Well, I'm not responsible for get up. I'm not responsible for get up whatsoever. Uh, and uh, that has, get up has, nothing to do uh, with my responsibilities and I would have thought uh, there are a range of issues I don't think anyone should be. I've called out when asked. Uh, Nicole Flint was subject to some dreadful misogynistic attacks that should not have happened. Thank you. Why isn't Henry here? Sure. Okay. And your climate modelling assumes no early 
Our climate plan is very clear, that our climate policy will not result in any bring forward of any of the existing uh, power plants. Uh, that's what we said and this announcement is uh, further evidence uh, that that is the case. Uh, we are seeing a, a, a shift in the, the production of energy. Uh, I find it extraordinary though that the national government did not get a heads up. The New South Wales government have known about this closure for six months and have been engaged in discussions with Origin. And the New South Wales Liberal government thinks so little of Angus Taylor and his failure to have a national energy policy at all that they didn't even bother to talk to him about it. It says everything about the failure of this government that have had more than 20, more than 20 sort of pseudo announcements about energy policies and haven't landed a single one. Labor has one policy that we've announced. It's a policy that will deliver 604,000 new jobs, five out of every six in regional communities. It will reduce emissions by 43% by 2030. It will have $52 billion of private sector investment. It will make an enormous difference so that the national energy market grid uh, will be 82% uh, powered uh, by renewables and it will reduce, it will reduce, that policy will reduce people's energy bills in the national energy market by $275. Now, this announcement is a direct result, a direct result of the uncertainty that is out there from this federal government uh, is creating uh, real concern uh, from industry and that's why our policy has been endorsed uh, by the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group, the National Farmers Federation and the ACTU. Only Labor has a policy to provide the certainty that business needs to invest to make sure we have lower energy prices. That's what our policy will do. It will make an enormous difference and this government, this government will just flail away and they've had almost a decade in office. They can't talk about any of their record in government. 